Welcome again to another edition of IDS Hour. I'm your host, Paul Honeycutt, joined as always by Jeff Wilker. And our special guest from last <laughs> time, if you didn't see that, go back and listen, uh, is David Gay. David from, uh, from Great Britain. He's over here visiting a number of different churches speaking. And uh, shortly he and Jeff are going to travel all the way down to Mexico City and do a New, new Covenant uh, Theology Conference in Mexico City. And probably eat a lot of tacos and all the rest that goes on with that. <laughs> but uh, last time we were talking about the law of Christ and some of the d- debate and confusion and so forth. This episode, we'd like to p- at least start out by talking about something we call progressive sanctification. How would you define that, David? Me? Well, this is how I would define it. The moment a sinner trusts Christ believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's united to Christ. She is. He is. And at that moment, they are justified by faith. But the Bible also uses the word sanctified, I think, in that respect. They are, Christ has made unto us sanctification. But the word sanctification also has another meaning to it. Speaking of the believer's life thereafter, the transformed life. As I read the Bible, I see that word sanctified speaks of the believers growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus and living more and more in likeness to the Lord Jesus. So, positional sanctification, uh, what he is in Christ, that's unchangeable. But then there is the progressive, the daily growing in the likeness of Christ in obedience to Scripture by the power of the Spirit. And I believe that Christ by his death, uh, accomplished this for us, uh, merited this for us. And I believe this is the gift of the new covenant, the Spirit to move us to live in likeness of Christ until ultimate glorification in Christ. That's how I would. Yeah, I I would understand it the same way. But let's, um, how about, let's give some examples of texts that we could look at. Yeah. This, This would be good to... Well, you want to start off? Well, of course... For me to start off would probably go to sort of a foundational text, would be Hebrews Hebrews chapter 10, because that does seem to be a text that people want to sort of, you know, uh, massage a bit Mm -hmm. to and end up saying that there really isn't any uh, progressive, that is, progressive sanctification. And let me rephrase that. What What I would mean, and Dave would mean the same thing, is as a believer... We, you become a believer. Your sins are when you believe. Your sins are forgiven, and you get that you have this new heart. That is the work of the Holy Spirit that's now motivating you to live for Christ. Okay, but the idea is that you do get better. In that your life gets better, never perfect. No, no, no. But it, Galatians five seventeen is very clear about that. That this side of heaven. We're never going to arrive, but we do get better. This does seem to be the problem. This really irks some New Covenant guys to talk in those terms, because they would then say that when you talk about getting better, in some sense that is undermining <laughs> the work of Christ on the no. cross that you get when you believe. No. And I, I don't remotely see the problem, but obviously... Uh, you know, it, it does exist. Is that sort of... Yeah. Well, you're talking about Hebrews 10.10, 10, aren't you? And Hebrews 10.14. Yes. Hebrews 10.10, 10, by, uh, by the will that he's speaking about earlier in the chapter, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then in verse 14, mm-hmm. by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy seems to me, put those two texts together, we are perfect in Christ, and yet in ourselves we are not, but we are being made perfect, transformed by the Holy Spirit. And it would seem in this context we have a, we would say probably not a typical way the author ha- uh, authors of Scripture handle this, but we have actually a commentary on verse 14, which is 15 through 18, where he says, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this, that he's going to explain it. Then he quotes in brief, Jeremiah 31, for this is the come that I will make with him after that time, 
says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. Well, that's, you know, that's quoted in Hebrews 8. Then he adds, their sins and law, lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins. He's talking about two different things that we get through the death of Christ, which is, well, first, is a new position with God, which new is position. getting our sins forgiven. We are given a status as though we are perfect, meaning he pays for all of our sins, so we have a clean record, and the only way you can get a clean record is obey perfectly, or have all of your sins forgiven. And if you have all of your sins forgiven, you are, by definition, righteous. Mm -hmm. And if you are righteous, then you're accepted. So another way of describing someone who has their sins forgiven is that you have been made perfect forever, which means the death of Christ on the cross to pay for your sins applies to you for eternity. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but it's, and then he focuses on the inward, where the law and the heart, write them on their, your minds. Now we're talking about the transforming work of the Holy Spirit that believers also get, which guarantees that they will be transformed and so that corresponds to those who are being made holy. In Greek, it's a present preposition. But the idea is this is a process taking place. This is not a moment in time. No, no. This is a process. That, that, that progressive is a, is a process, yes. Yeah. yeah, and we think of something like Philippians 1, six: He who began a good mm. work in you will keep on doing it until the day of Christ Jesus. And of course, the writer of the Hebrews goes on in chapter 10, verse 19, the heading over my Bible here, which is not inspired, but is good, a call to persevere, there lists now a long string of duties and encouragements flowing out of this principle. We are holy, but we now have to work out this holiness. Mm -hmm. Indeed, Philippians 2, you know, work out your own salvation, for it's God mm -hmm. who works in you, both to will and to do, but you have a responsibility. By the way, I would see a, another text in Hebrews here, Hebrews 12, verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. There I see the law of Christ. There's a command to yeah. me. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, okay, you could say that without that positional holiness, you're ne never saved. But that's true. But I think in the context here, make every effort. This is my works. Yes, we something we need to do. <laughs> so if I'm not working out, my every, making every effort, if I'm not being progressively sanctified, then I'm not a Christian. A man can profess to be a believer, mm. but if he's not a new creature and showing it in his life, then his profession is vain. Yeah, this is, you know, the book of James. Faith no. without works <laughs> is dead. Just because you profess that professions are cheap, the proof of the pudding is that you have a transformed life. Now, it's interesting because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. What I have found, this is the uh, a book by Peterson from Australia, who's strongly tried to make the case there's no progressive sanctification and he latches on to the word holy and he and he takes he goes back to the old covenant era where we would all agree that well the basic meaning of holy is is that you're clean you know ser but it's separated it's ceremonially clean yes yeah, separated so now you're ceremonially clean well that's the way god was illustrating truths through an unbelieving people mm -hmm. israel but now in the New Covenant era, he's not talking about a concept of clean versus unclean. That whole that category has been removed. Now he's talking in terms of being, you know, you know, either having your sins forgiven or have being transformed from the inside out. And now you're living for Christ. So now holiness has a concept of way of life. Yes. And same difference. We we Dave and I were talking about the same difference. The word righteousness. Mm. If you if you did a word study in righteousness and you started from the Old Testament, you would in the Old Testament you would clearly get a definition that righteousness is a way of life, a certain way of life. Whereas if you go to the New Apostle Paul, who's the primary user of the term, he it clearly has not 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 anything to do with the way of life. It's your standing with God, because Jesus died for your sins, satisfied God's wrath on your behalf. You are you have now righteousness. So, two different uh, definitions, you, in each has a unique context, you can't confuse the two. So this is just... Well, and what you said just now is very important. I know some New Covenant people are frightened of the uh, idea that if we 
talk about progressive, then somehow we've weakened our position in Christ. But that's not true at all. We're only progressively sanctified because we are positionally sanctified. Um, and there's, there's no... If we're not doing it to earn our salvation and all the rest of it, 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 and we're not weakening the work of Christ, but we are called in the New Testament to work out this salvation that he's worked within us. I get, I would say we are affirming the work of Christ. Yeah, well, they say you are yeah, demonstrating it. Yeah. yeah, the fact is, if you go to First John, yeah, well, yeah. which is sort of has all sorts of passages, let's say First John 3, 10. Yeah. Well, well, you know, the idea of this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. He clearly is saying there has to be a change in your life. There has to be. I mean, Paul and I were talking in another uh, context about someone who's trying to make the case that I, I've been a believer for many, many years, mm-hmm. but there's been no fundamental transformation. Mm-hmm. But I'm, and not expected. Right. And of course we would say, well, then that means you're no believer. Mm. Because that means that Jesus didn't die for you, because everybody for whom he dies, he not only pays for their sins, but he transforms them. Well, that was in the reading this morning, you remember, in the assembly when we met together. Uh, 2 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 3, uh, verse 18. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed mm. into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Transforming. Yes. We are transformed in the sense that we are made completely new in Christ, and now we are being transformed in our daily lives. Mm. Yeah, I think what, what we, we see, and I think this is somewhat common in error, is that they try? Is that there is a sort of a mic, uh, microscopic examination of a portion of a verse or a word, and you and blowing things out of proportion or twisting context so that you're trying to read into it something that's not there. Mm-hmm. So this idea of progressive, it, it really is. You need to step back a second, get the bigger picture. Example like the whole chapter six of Romans. I mean, chapter six in Romans, it starts out by this sort of, at least for us, a crazy question. <laughs> you know, the idea of, what shall we say then? 6-1. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Of course, it's the right question, if you, uh, which is asked by people who think the New Covenant theology or the, the apostolic doctrine is so free in grace, but that's what the gospel is. It is so free. Yeah. But the, that's not, it, 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 you don't allow it to stand for 10 seconds, does he? No, but if you didn't believe in progressive sanctification, this question would be quite relevant because there'd be no change. But Paul says, by no means we die to sin. How, yeah. How can we live in any longer? And die to sin means sin no longer controls you. You have a new motivating influence that's going to transform you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's going to drive you like a hound of heaven to live for Christ. And, and that's why believers look differently. And, and that actually is the emphasis in the New Testament. Of course it is. Of course. It's not forgiveness of sins, because that's a legal transaction in the court of heaven. We can't see that, but we can see the, the, the uh, changed life. Let me take you to one point, because I, I want your thoughts. Sometimes we, oh, David and I are always comparing, you know, <laughs> what do you think of this verse? And Go on, they've got how, to... how do you take that? Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. Right. Mm. When I... Um, the four laws. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I was a younger uh, be- believer, I, this seemed a little strange to me. Let me explain what I mean by strange. Um, the verse says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, just stop there. That's verse 1. In my thinking, when you talk up in terms of no condemnation, in my mind, I give a knee jerk reaction ah, because my sins are forgiven. So God's wrath has been satisfied by Christ's death on the cross. Well, that's why I'm no longer condemned. And of course, that's true. Actually, 3, 4, and 5, we'll talk about that. But that's not what Paul's talking about in 8. Because he says in verse 2, because the reason you there, you there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and, de- law of sin and death. What is he saying? He's talking about that because I'm a believer, that there is a the, there's this law of sin and death, which which is another way of saying sin controls you. 
that that's been broken. Now I'm characterized by the law of the Spirit in my life. That is, he's tra- the Holy Spirit's transforming me. The rest of, or at least in the first 27 verses of Romans 8, describe in detail what, what the Holy Spirit is doing in the life of every believer. But Paul, is, his point is, is that the reason we know that there's no con- condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus is because of your transformed life. It, that, that, I mean, that, that must be right. I mean, I mean, obviously, in verse 1, he's picking up from what he said already. Yes. Because I think we would agree that there's a, a parenthesis just before that. We won't develop that now. But he's picking up what he said already. Right. We are justified. But it's not enough just to drop the justify. I am justified. I am justified. That is right. But as you quite rightly say, the, the, this passage is going on. Indeed, in chapter 6, he's already begun in sanctification. So he's developing it here. Um, yeah, and of course he's talking about living. Verse yeah. four. I mean, look at look, and, and uh, he's talking about living here. Yeah, the whole idea is the he's talking about the evidence. Evidence. Yes. Yeah, it's in that sense, it's like James. Hmm. The evidence that you have your sense that you have saving faith is you have a transformed life. This is this is progressive sanctification. You are being transformed, made more and more Christ-like by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gets all the credit. We don't take any credit. And it's not perfect stuff, perfect good works, that therefore the works in and of themselves don't merit anything, but they are clear and convincing evidence. And I think, can I just add evidence there to the other person? Yes. Uh, so that other people can see that it's not just talk, but it's walk as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it seems kind of, uh, at least to us, it seems kind of obvious, but... Uh, well, the whole context here as he goes on about being controlled by the flesh but controlled by the spirit, living it out. He's clearly speaking here in the realm of practical daily, day, day, day by day living. Hmm. And it's, although the word sanctified is not you, this is what it's about, isn't it? That's what he's talking about here. Yeah, if you get down to uh, verses 3 and 4, which is really, in many ways, sort of a parallel passage to Hebrews ten fourteen in that it describes what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. For it says, for what the law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened... That's the law of Moses. Yes, but I I think even generically, any law... Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, even the law of Christ today, if you're not a believer... Of course. Yeah, yeah, it has... Law has no power to transform you. Right. And, well, then, how did God address this? Well, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering, the cross... And so, now he's going to talk about what the cross accomplished. And so he condemned sin in sinful man, which is what he did on the cross, in order, now we get to the results, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. So he addresses both. First is the righteous requirements of the law are fully met by Christ paying for all of our sins. Because if he pays for all of our sins... We get a clean record, which is the identical record you would have if you obeyed the law perfectly. Yeah. But we don't. We get that standing by having our sins forgiven, okay? And therefore, we meet the righteous requirements of the law because the law demands that. And but we also get this transformed life that we live according to the Spirit. We are we're different people, which is what the rest of Romans eight is all about. Well, Romans eight twelve ties up with the previous clip we made. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. The sons of God are led by the Spirit. You receive a Spirit and so on, and the Spirit testifying Mm. with our spirit. But it's all in the context of living out what Christ has worked in us by His Spirit. That's how I see it anyway. Yeah, in many ways, I would see this from the point of view of uh, results it, 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 as the, the centerpiece of this salvation, it producing a people zealous for good, good works. works yeah. Right. Even it, it is the cross, and of course the payment for sin gets us unconditionally accepted, but it's this radical work of transformation by the Holy Spirit which is, produces a holy people mm. who are fundamentally different and it's observable of course observable yeah. observable measurable yeah. which is we were you know we were maybe just we have a few minutes remaining here 
because I know you're in the midst of writing an, another book on uh, this the whole attempt in and uh, here you're going to go to uh, Br British church history to undermine the, the necessity of a transformed life by redefining saving faith. Yes, right, Sandemanian. Yeah, why don't you share a little bit about that? Well, Robert Sandeman was a Scotsman, 1720s approximately, and he and his father-in-law, John Glass, um, objected to the notion of bringing feelings into the point of faith. They didn't want to compromise faith, and they said, therefore, that faith was a bare assent to the truth. You present men with the gospel facts, and if men can tick the boxes, hmm. they are saved. I mean, men like Zane Hodges today have websites promoting this. An assurance for them is if you have ticked the boxes, if you believe that Christ is the Son of God, then you are saved. But the New Testament makes it very clear to me that it's not just mental assent, you believe with the heart. With the heart man believes to righteousness and so on. And that always manifests itself, as we're saying now, the full circle, that always manifests itself in a changed life. And uh, by their fruits ye shall know them. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, the word I would bring in, just uh, I know we're getting to the end, is the word antinomian mm -hmm. here. Now, uh, uh, people like us, uh, as you want to we know, are called antinomians. Now, in a sense, I don't mind being called an antinomian. I welcome it. I do so because Romans 3 shows me, unless you can be called an antinomian in preaching the gospel, you're not preaching the gospel freely enough. Mm -hmm. But if I'm going to be called an antinomian because I think there's no place for a written commandment for me in my life and there's no progressive sanctification then I think we're on very thin ice do you mm. understand that phrase in America? Yes, thin we ice? Do. Yeah, yeah. even playing... though we live in a desert yeah, we don't yeah, have yeah, ice yeah. very often I know, I, I, I know you're in mean and it means that we don't but alright then we're on thin ice we're, or we're playing with fire do you understand that word? yes we do and I covet being called a libertine or an antinomian for the grace of the gospel but any suggestion that we're not promoting holiness of life is, by our teaching, is dangerous, I think, and or, wrong. Or going mm. back to Matthew 11, where it talks about believers are yoked to yes. Christ. We Yo lo yeah. Well, that, yeah. Lordship is a willing loke. Or let me just close in Ro yeah. Romans 6, verses 17 and 18, which really just describes what we've been talking about, where Paul says, but thanks be to God, He's talking to believers that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obey the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin, that is, sin no longer controls you, and have become slaves to righteousness. Well, there is this is no clear passage about the transformation and the idea of why believers do get better, you know, and but God gets all the credit. And because uh, Jesus, by his death on the cross, he did purchase this transforming work of the Spirit. Go on and read verse 19 and 20, I would say also. You can carry on to the end of the chapter, and indeed into chapter 7. Oh, seven. yes. Yeah. Carries on. So. Good they, conversation, guys. Uh, as always, if you uh, have questions, comments, we welcome them. We really do. Jeff can be reached uh, easiest by phone. At uh, area code 480-313-8558. Uh, my email address is volker.jeff at gmail.com. Skype, the, my nickname, I guess, is just Jeff Volker with no spacing. And uh, I uh, would remind you that please feel free to contact by email, but don't expect a long, mm -hmm. extended email discussion. I will then contact you and say we'll continue this on the phone mm -hmm. or Skype one way or the other. You can get me by... David H. J. Gay, that's G A Y, at googlemail.com. I welcome your emails again. I can't always answer in full detail at once. Or if you want to see my books, Amazon, uh, Kindle, David H. J. Gay again, Sermon Audio, YouTube. You're welcome to look. Wonderful. Thanks for being here, David. Thank you. Thank you. Really been good. Thank you. We'll talk to you next time.